joined by Sugot and we are learning about experiences in Ghana and we are very happy to have with us the author of this case study, Shifa Torbikei and Silvia Ohenemarfu. Shifa is a research fellow at the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research at the University of Ghana. She is also the program officer for the Feminist Africa Journal based at the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. She holds a PhD in Development Studies from the University of Ghana's Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research. Shifa research interests include agrarian livelihoods, gender and migration. And Sylvia is a food studies researcher and focuses on the importance of food in all aspects of society, which is embedded in the sociology of food and agriculture. She is the research and programs manager for the Union for African Population Studies. Sylvia holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Ghana. So thank you both for joining us today. And um, before starting to discuss the specific case of public-private partnerships in Ghana, we would really love to learn about your own trajectory as feminists. What brought you into feminism? Shifa, you want to start answering that? Okay, thank you so much. I have been a feminist from day one. I have been at the forefront of struggles in the home or in school. And feminism came to me naturally because I usually have to fight oppression. I read a lot of literature that gave me the context and also more knowledge about struggles. That's very nice. Sylvia, you want to come in with that answer? Yes, contrary to what you first said, I wasn't a feminist growing up. And I always say that because I was raised in a home where we were treated the same, regardless of whether you're a boy or a girl. My first time of actually encountering the notion of gender inequality and feminism was in lecture with Professor Akusia Dakwa. It was through her class that I realized that kind of gender inequality in the world. And there's a movement called feminism that women come together to try to fight for the rights of women to be recognized, for women to get access to things that they are ideally supposed to get access to. So that's it. Thank you, Sylvia. So Ghana has long been portrayed as the star pupil by the IMF and the World Bank for implementing global neoliberal development strategies. The country has undertaken economic restructuring since the 80s, and has integrated PPP modalities since the early 90s. And in this process, it has privatized numerous state-owned enterprises, and it has, in a way, we could say, clean up the banking sector to the point that now 50% of the banks are foreign-owned. And many people see this as a way to channel capital away from the country rather than investing in national development, especially through providing domestic credit. Ghana has also embraced new public management strategies and decentralization is now embedded in its governance frameworks and processes. Ghana has also ratified global instruments to promote gender and development and it actively supports the sustainable development goal effort. So in this way, Ghana is a shining example of the Africa rising vision promoted by the global community. So I want to ask you, Shifa, is this how the narrative is perceived nationally? For a very long time, Ghana has been acclaimed as a peaceful country. But if you ask me today, I'm very sure that many people are looking at that differently because of the fallout from all these developments, experiments that are carried out in the country. In the current context of debt crisis and then the economic crisis, where Ghana goes to the IMF for the 17th time, you will realize that people are asking what has been the outcome of these neoliberal developments and ideologies that have been pushed to the country. In fact, in the diplomatic sectors, many are also asking these questions about Ghana, its trajectory of development, how its natural resources are extracted, its development model, and in recent times, its human rights records, it's press freedom. So we know that all these are part of the package of the neoliberal development. And so the PPPs are a part of the vehicle. It's a package that has unfolded in little bits, although the story started 40 years ago. And so when we put this in a context of the current debt crisis in Ghana, we see that the country is even more vulnerable than before, more vulnerable than 40 years ago, and it will continue to be vulnerable in the near future.
Thanks very much, Jifa. I think following up on your reflections, we'd like to know a little bit more about the context around public-private partnerships or PPPs in the country. So often the narrative is that PPPs will improve services and will benefit communities. But the case study shows that this is not the case. And as you were saying, there's increasing questioning around this model of development. And we know that Ghana has has many different kinds of PPPs. So could you maybe add any additional reflections on the historical and current context that led to the development of this PPP? What are the prevailing narratives about the feasibility and contradictions of PPPs? And overall, what are your reflections on the PPP model for addressing Ghana's problems and for contributing to development in the country? Ghana's PPP trajectory should be located within its about 40 years of privatization. So for 40 years, we went through privatization of many sectors of the economy. Education, for example, health, energy. The current PPPs are also not isolated. They are also linked to the past in the 70s, what the states did to recover from an economic crisis. But at the time, the state's use of PPPs was a different kind because the state was very much present and the PPPs were to prevent capital flights from the country in the 70s. This current PPPs that we see is more extractivist kind of development where the state, because of its sovereignty, is to back capital to expand. So what happens now is that private capital will want to use the state to get capital accumulation. Your case study focuses exactly on the development of organized markets where a growing array of products is sold, ranging from agricultural produce to handicrafts to use the clothing and other imported goods. And market women's associations are an important element of these historical markets. As you have taught us, traditional the market and product queens allocate trader space, facilitate receipt and pricing of goods, solve disputes and provide for the general welfare of members. There is also an integrated hierarchy of association from the level of an individual product led by an item queen to the overall market queen. And this extends to broader associations associations such as the Greater Accra Market Associations led by queens from many markets in the city. PPP modalities, as you said, are used to build and redevelop markets. However, there have been many impacts on the market, women and their associations. So we want you, Sylvia, to comment on the case. Can you summarize the full story of this case study? Where are the main insights, learning from the study? What is the current status of the DOM market project? Has the state developed phase been completed? And what has the impact been on women's associations and member livelihoods after completion? How have the women's associations responded? And in the past, mostly agricultural produce was sold and engagements between the traders and farmers contributed to overall food security. Now more imported consumer goods, including secondhand clothing, are being sold. So has there been any impact on food security through this shift? The Domi Market PPP started somewhere around 2014. But prior to that, there were a lot of changes from the macro level all the way down to the district assembly. Government was struggling with funds. So the usual assembly common fund, which was already inadequate, became the target. So governments more or less reduced their money as well as gave directions to municipal and district assemblies on how they should disperse the money. So most of the district assemblies across the country became cash trapped. Already revenue collection in the market, which is the main avenue for generating revenue for the district assemblies, was very poor. So the idea for modernizing the market to make it easy for revenue collection became very important things for district assemblies. But because these district assemblies lacked money, they couldn't modernize the market themselves. Hence the decision to go into PPPs to support in modernizing the market for them. 
What we realized in Domi Market was that although the District Assembly followed the laid out framework in the National PPP policy of 2011, they did that only as an add-on measure. For instance, when they had a stakeholder engagement with the women through their leaders, it was basically to take the box. Whatever the women told them in terms of the size of the market, of the shops that were going to build, in terms of the lack of fan status of these women, all those things were not taken into consideration. And the shops were built in the way that the district assembly had already envisioned when they decided to modernize the market. Of course, when the shops were built, a whole lot of issues came up in terms of allocation, in terms of the price of the rent that the women are supposed to pay. In terms of the design, it wasn't according to what the women wanted. It was bigger lockable shops, which was not favorable for most of the women because of the kinds of goods that they sell. If you sell agricultural products, you can't lock them up in a shop. So that affected the structure of the market as it is. Most of the PPP shops are occupied by people who were not part of the market at the beginning, who were not even selling the market prior to the PPP. So these are new traders who have come in and have captured all the PPP shops we have available. And uh, women who are displaced as a result of the PPP shops, very few of them are still in the market. Most of them working in selling in sheds or under umbrellas or whatever space they could find in front of other people's shops. So it has really impacted on the livelihood of uh, the women who are displaced as a result of the PPP, as well as even the women who are there currently, because some of the goods that they sell are now sold in these big, big shops. As we talked about in our paper, one of the things that happened was that when the big shops were built and the women realized how they became disadvantaged, when the government wanted to build more sheds, and the PPP, they resisted. I mean, they used all kinds of avenues that they could find to make sure that that doesn't happen. And in the end, they won. The states came back to develop their shares. These started somewhere 2020, and they are still not completed. The first 100 have been built. They've been roofed. The areas around it have been cleaned with gutters constructed and all that, but there is no water, there's no light. There's no sanitation project going on right now as we speak. So it's still there, not completed, it's still unoccupied. And the women who were moved from that area to make way for those sheds have to join other women at the back of the shed. And what I noticed on my recent visit to the market was that because it's been raining for some time, the women there came together, contributed and built sheds of their own, and they shared it equal among themselves. So far as you contributed, you have a space. So now all these women have spaces to sit and a shed to cover their heads away from the elements of the weather. The problem we have in the market is the divided associations that we have because we have they have two market queens and uh, or two of our own market queens. So depending on which of the market queens you have allegiance to. With regards to food security, so Domi market has quite an interesting system where early mornings are for farmers to sell. And then from 7 p.m., the actual owners of actual people who own the sheds and shops in the market come to the market to sell. So between 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., farmers come in to display their wares and then sell it off, usually food items from their farms. And then from 7 a.m. till they close, another group of market traders come to the market. And these are the actual owners of the sheds and the shops we have in the market. Usually Sundays are often declared as a farmer's market. So when you go to the market on Sundays, all you see is food items all over the market. The problem with food security is not necessarily the availability of food. However, it's the pricing system, it's affordability. Yes, you find food all over the market, but the price of the food are quite expensive and which actually is in line with the current debt crisis that we have in Ghana, as well as the high inflation rates we have in the country. Thank you so much for giving that really good overview of the specific case study. It really seems to raise issues around governance on two levels. Firstly, at the local level, we see a top-down privatized model that's effectively excluded people's participation Despite the mainstream development modeling the country promoting participation by communities, we saw, however, that the market women through their associations didn't agree with the redevelopment model and were able to stop the development of the private actor by appealing directly to political party stakeholders. Similar strategies have worked in other PPP market disputes, and it seems 
is though one of the issues is that considerable responsibility has been devolved to local government without provision of adequate financing. And you were talking about that tension because the councils were dependent on collecting fees from the markets, but it really has turned out to be insufficient to even fully develop the market after the council took over responsibility again. At the same time, at the national level, we've been hearing about the macro issues, the debt levels, the inflation and the impact on people. And I wondered, Tifa, if you could maybe reflect on what are the implications and the potential for effective national and local governance in Ghana? And secondly, can you reflect on the state's ability to fundamentally change this PP and the whole neoliberal strategy? And I guess ultimately, what are the implications for for national sovereignty and for holding companies accountable and for addressing urgent development priorities. Thank you. Given the current context of governance in the country, we are facing a lot of crisis at the governance level as well. So as we face financial crisis, debt crisis and socioeconomic crisis, we are also facing governance crisis at all levels. There's little accountability. Nobody accounts to anybody and there's little that people are doing. But I will say that if we rely on the state, PPPs will not change. The neoliberal vehicle will continue and will be more repressive because for many of the neoliberal projects, especially those that are very extractive, the people involved are linked to the political parties, the political regime. So there's a little capture of the state. You can make a law and the law benefits your cronies because they have the funds, they have the knowledge, they have the information. So before you, ordinary person, decide to even bid for a PPP project, someone linked to the state knows about it already and goes ahead. We can learn from what the women did, the advocacy, the activism, the demonstration, the protests, to mount pressure on the states to change course. But the state itself will not change course. By putting pressure on the state not to continue the projects in the markets, for the state to go back there to build some structures on a non-PPP basis means that we all can do the same. We would like to come to the issue of the feminist movement because, of course, women do not form a monolithic group. And one of the issues raised is the growing class differentiation between traditional market women traders who are poor and the better off women who now run the closed shops built by PPPs. And so livelihoods of poor women appear to be increasingly at risk. Can you tell us a little bit more about the impact on market women traders and the kind of risks they may face in the future? And especially, how does the feminist movement in Ghana view the context and issues of market women? And um, whether there are critiques about the mainstream neoliberal gender frameworks, strategies and policies being pushed through this model? And what alternative or progressive gender frameworks, strategies and policies are being discussed and advanced in Ghana? So women's movement in Ghana has been very active in women's rights issues, including economic rights. And the market is part of that. They talk about the harassment of the state's machinery of women in the market and on the streets, how their trading spaces are becoming gentrified. They talk about macroeconomic issues that affect their activities. And the feminist movement, although not engaged directly with issues about PPPs, has been taking part of the debate about space, whether space in market or space in mining fields or space in educational sector, space for women and space that is sustainable. So in the wider debate about what women can get from development and also for women to be recognized as equal citizens, the feminist movement has engaged directly with this kind of debates. And the feminist movement in Ghana has been asking the state to take critical part in development in a way that is sustainable. So even if the markets are developed with PPP, it should be that every woman can benefit. And it talks about equity. And it also champions the issue about women's sovereignty within the market because the markets in Ghana are the women's spaces. So once that space is attached, PPPs have not come to the forefront yet in that debate. But then the general problems of neoliberalism has been debated. The women want to be engaged in development. They want to have a say in whatever development you have on their behalf. 
It really seems as though the current struggle that the market women have undertaken in the domain market, PPP, are really a continuation of what's happened over many, many years. And we know that market women have been lauded as heroes, for example, during the independence struggle. And as uh, Jifa had mentioned, they'd also been attacked and even killed during the 1979 army attacks on market women. They've also been vilified in the media as economic cartels and mafia out to sabotage the free market system. And yet the women's organizations have resisted and defied the pushback and have been successful even recently, as we saw in reversing government policy. And yet, from what we've learned from the case study, there seems to be a change because there's now an influx of new people in the market with growing class differentiation there are many better off people who are now starting to rent. And it seems as though many, if not most, are not joining the market associations. And this really raises questions about the impact on market association membership and strength. So Sylvia, I wonder if you could maybe reflect a little bit on what's happening to market women's associations at the moment. Are they weakening given the saturation of market trade? How do they view the risk of all these people becoming involved in the markets? And finally, we've heard a bit about it, but is there any engagement with the broader Ghana feminist movement? And what are potential ways forward to safeguard poor market women interests and their associations? So um, regarding the nature of market associations, when you look at most of the markets, I think there's a stronger bond between item leaders and their members compared to an allegiance to a market queen. That's the impression I get. The people who sell fish, for instance, have a bigger kind of relationship with their item leader and feel that they belong to that association, the Fish Traders Association, than the relationship they would have with the overall queen in the market, in the case of Domi, for instance. So I think the organizing women based on the items that they sell, that place is a bit strong compared to organizing women in a particular market under a queenship system. That's a bit weakened because of the political issues that have come up and how the PPP, for instance, the Mendomi market was designed and implemented. Going forward, I think that would pose a risk. If the women are not united at the front with one market queen, the assembly will be able to implement whatever they please, and that would affect the livelihood of the women in the market. One of the things I also noticed, which I'm actually very pleased about, is the fact that there's an awakening of the women in the market to the fact that they are in the middle of a political system where the ruling party and the opposition is just using them to get votes, come into power, and then take decisions that are contrary to what they need and would affect their livelihood. An example is the current member of parliament for Domi Kwabenya constituency. She's been absent in the political scene for a while, and she came back and visited the market, thinking that she would get a rousing welcome from the women. On the contrary, they actually hooted at her, mocked her, and eventually more or less kicked her out of the market because it was through her that the PPP came and uh, she was also there when they were building the sheds. I mean, through her connections and links that the government virtually left over the PPP project and decided to come in to build the sheds. But the shed has been there for three years without it being completed. The grievance of the women have not been heard over those years. So the women have a walking to that system of not being used as pawns in a game and puppets for the progress of one party over another. Thank you, Sylvia. And coming to the end, we wanted to ask you for a final word on the ways forward in this context, but more generally, what gives you hope? What gives us hope? There have been a lot of youth agitation and protests in the country these few years, in the past six years, especially the last two, three years, there has been a lot. This year alone, There'll be a lot of protests by young people on the streets. They have started this activism on Twitter, social media, and also on the streets. So they are not only active online, they are active on the ground. And so we know that there is hope. There's hope that everywhere people are tired and fed up with the political system we have, with the misgovernance and its attendance, problems of corruption, etc. We can learn from the model of building markets in the past where communities come together, they do something we call communal labor, 
where people bring the tools that they have. If you have a catalyst, you bring it. If you have a hole, you bring it and you clear the space and you build a market. Communities can mobilize people, invite the state to take part in building infrastructure, not only markets. So for me, we have hope that people are ready to mobilize themselves for development. What we need is a state that is interested in this. So we learn from the women, they contributed money to start building sheds for themselves, to make their livelihoods sustainable. And for me, that is what we have to learn from these women. This micro resistance is something that we can learn from. And we can implement this in our small corners in the country where the state itself can also learn from this. Thank you, Shifa. Sylvia, you want to come in? Okay, so I would say, yes, there is hope. One bit of case study, which I think we didn't hammer a lot on, was that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the community members came together and realized that they can't go to Domi to shop in this era of COVID with the whole notion of social distancing and all of that. Appealed to the assembly and the chiefs of Kwabenya to give them land to start a market. And that's what happened. They got the land, the women came together, contributed money, built sheds, and they now own these sheds. Of course, they pay daily tolls to the assembly as well as to the chiefs in that area. Most of the women who are occupants of the Kwabenya market actually come from Domi market. Some of them were displaced as a result of the PPP and uh, they found solace in starting a place in the Kwabenya market. The Kwabenya market today is big. It's getting bigger and bigger by the day. And I feel that they've learned the lessons that the people in the Domi market had to go through. They've learned it a lot. They've also instituted a system of having item leaders. They actually don't have a market queen, which I'm very sure is a ripple effect of what they've seen in the Domi market. Market. So they have item leaders who organize them and mobilize them for whatever they need to do. That market gives me hope. The whole idea of working together for the women within the market to continue to have a space where they can engage economically and get the livelihood that they need, the resource that they need to take care of their families. I mean, that gives me hope. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sylvia and Shifa, for taking us through this fascinating case in Ghana and also for giving us hope. So thanks a lot and we invite everyone to learn more about this case and the other PPP cases through Dawn Feminist social media and website. Thank you. This podcast series was produced by Dawn, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era. Today's episode was edited by Alicia Furtado and engineered by Ernesto Sena. Thank you for joining us. See you on the next episode.